Assume that um, you were in a time machine and you went 15 years into the future. And the parts per million, the carbon parts per million, you know, instead of being 410, it was 710. And assume that the floodwaters had risen. And now you were the president. So assume it's 15 years in the future, everything's way, way accelerated dramatically. You are the president, you have full control, you can take any actions. <laughs> what are the exact things that we would do that would have the most, forgetting about what you think, what would work? If we got into a situation where we understood we were in the worst of the worst shapes, what would actually work? If everyone would cooperate, if we would, you know, what could we do if we could, if everyone was willing to do anything, what would you do? Is there a giant sucking machine we could build? Is there something, like what, what would you do? You take, you know, number one, you'd say no one's allowed to eat meat ever again. You take that off, that, you know, if that was causing a problem. The first thing is the public have to be told the truth. They have to be told the terrible truth. I forgot to mention that atmospheric carbon dioxide concentration is the highest in three to five million years. Our species has only been around a couple of hundred thousand years. Um, uh, atmospheric methane goes back to um, uh, the cattle meat thing, but it's not only that. Um, uh, wetland rice paddies is a big source of methane, and unfortunately we got global warming, so that's increasing the methane. Methane level right now um, I got the latest figures because um, uh, the, apparently the uh, government has gone back to work, so NOAA is being allowed to publish the figures again. So that's why I know that um, CO2 is um, uh, the um, seasonally adjusted mean CO2 is uh, over, over 410, it's 412 now. Atmospheric methane is 1,870. Now to put that into some context, and the public has to be told these truths and the public also has to have it explained to them and this job is the job of government to do that unfortunately we have a government that is doing uh, exactly the opposite so CO2 um, it's past 800,000 year ice core limit 300 it's now at 412 so the public has to get this right they have to be told this over and over and over methane's concentration over 800,000 years the maximum was 800 right we're now at um, well over two and a half times. So um, uh, um, they have to be told the res effect that this is going to have. And they have to be told there is no time left. It's very clear from the uh, last assessment from the IPCC. Um, uh, the IPCC gave us numbers as well, and that was a very good thing that they did, right? The media picked it up, um, uh, and what it means is that um, uh, by 2030, right, CO2 emissions have to be cut in, uh, cut in half. 45% 2010 have to be cut in half. That has to happen. Um, and uh, the other interesting thing that wasn't picked up that I can share with you is that the IPCC worked out the amount of reduction of each particular fossil fuel by 2050 so that um, uh, we could keep um, the global surface temperature uh, hopefully below 1.5 degrees C by 2100, but the way they put it was it'll overshoot a bit and maybe then we can bring it down. But they said that we had to, um, uh, fossil fuel emissions had to be, uh, no, fossil fuel energy on average had to be reduced 86% by 2050. So the, the numbers, I think, have to be gotten out there as well. And that, pr because it's scientific proof, I, ag I agree with your point about the, uh, uh, about the state of the science, but um, uh, fossil fuel age has to be ended, right. Can, and I, uh, soon. Right. Yes. Well, if you were saying we got to 700 parts per million or something like that, which wouldn't happen in 15 years, but if we got that far, um, you know, we're in deep doo-doo at that point. And as, at that point, do you say, okay, geoengineering. Now, I cringe at that because <laughs> of the law of unintended consequences, but if you're at 700 parts per million, 
maybe this is the time where you say, okay, I'm going to send a fleet of airplanes out there and I'm going to seed the stratosphere with lots of sulfate aerosols to simulate a whole bunch of volcanic eruptions. Boy, I'd hate to do that because of the law of unintended consequences. I could imagine a world where CO2 levels are really high and there's so many aerosols in the atmosphere I can't see to the end of the room, okay? But if we got to 700 parts per million, where do you go? Drastic action at that point. Yeah, you're right. And, and we need, a, we need a, a, a global climate and oceans Manhattan project, right? So I, I think that's a great example. You know, I mean, it's a bad example because the United States um, they got all the best scientists together, right? And they put them in uh, somewhere in the middle of the desert and said, you've got to come up with a bomb, right? <laughs> and they only, had, they only had formulae to start with, you know? Winter. They had nothing, you know? <laughs> Uh, it was it was it was a very bad, nasty thing to do, but it was it was a brilliant achievement. It was absolutely amazing. Surely to God we can do that, you know, and put all the experts together in one place and say, we are going to pay you lots of money. You can have all the resources you want. Okay, just um, come up with the cutting edge, the very best renewable energy and some safe, predictable method to get some CO2 out of the atmosphere. It, 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 it's going to take that. Hopefully, the military will uh, will will get, will push some sense into the present government. Sorry, I should have been looking at the audience. I'm sorry. I'm I'm I'm, I'm trying to get my points across to you, not to the other panel members. But you you really do deserve to to know the truth and to know that there are solutions there, and the solutions got, have got to be made to happen like now. So, um, with your question, Steve, I think you should probably have another author up here whose name I can't remember, but it's actually apparently a nom de plume. He wrote a book called Ultimatum, he or she, and I, I think he goes by the name Glass, but people think that it was one of the US negotiators under the Framework Convention. Um, it's about the 2032 federal presidential election. Uh, and the big issue and the act of government um, that is enacted to answer your question about 15 years from now, 13, 14, whenever 2032 is, is a tax policy and an eminent domain policy to basically relocate much of the United States population because by then the sea level rise is kicking in Miami, Boston, New York, San Francisco Bay, parts of LA, they're all going under and we basically have to build the new Manhattan in Kansas and the new Miami in Dakota and, and all the rest of it. And so the first act of the government of 2032 or 33, when that election will occur is this relocation, the great relocation. But I'm not arguing that that's what the act should be. What I think it should be, uh, to answer your question and to try to respond a little bit to my friend here, Peter, is not to drum the numbers more into the heads of our dumb children than and others because it doesn't motivate them. I have teenagers. I tell them why failing exams is not good for their careers and it's not as good as trying to open their eyes to motivation. You know, if you read The Little Prince, he's Antoine de Saint-Exupéry or whatever his name was, said something like, if you want to cross the ocean don't organize the people and buy the lumber and divide the labor and start building ships. Teach them to yearn for the vast endless ocean. And we have to give people something that we're for, not something that we're against. We have to stop talking about this problem, depressing people with the science, killing people with the numbers, boring people with the facts. I, I hate to say it, but the communication we as a movement, and I'm taking responsibility for this because I've done this as a job since 1992. I was arrested in Rio at the Earth Summit. I was arrested at subsequent Earth Summits. I was arrested with Jim Hansen at the White House to stop the Keystone XL thing because they needed a business guy. I, I, you know, I do business, I invest in this stuff. And yet the bulk of our communications for that 30 year career of mine has been, you all are doing the wrong thing, burning fossil fuels and being bad and killing your kids. But do you know what the human animal hears because of our biological wiring and our brain science? You all are doing. 
That's where it stops. Our ability to comprehend things is relatively limited as a species, and we reinforce the behavior every time we say it. If we were saying, you all are building the solution, you are all doing the right things by lightening your footprint, by lowering your meat consumption, by adopting those solutions, by buying solar, by voting for the Green New Deal, by doing these things, you might actually give, give this millennial generation some hope rather than despair, some opportunity rather than dismay, something to live for rather than just to go up and die for. I'm sorry, but I feel like we sound like a bunch of old people who have got to that stage in our lives where the young kids are all screwed and we have screwed the pooch ourselves and we're sort of owning it and we're not giving any future to anyone. And I, that is the greatest shame on us because it is incumbent on us as people of privilege and power, which we have, we author books, we do lectures, we do this stuff, to provide answers, not problems. With respect for your um, superior criminal record to mine, um, we are fighting, Dr. Hansen's been fighting for years and years and years, we're, you know, we're working hard on behalf of today's children. That's what we're doing, I, right? I, I respect we're do that. And hang on a minute, hang on a minute. We are not telling anybody, particularly the young people, that this is their fault. It's the fault of how we're governed. It's the fault of our system. It's the fault of the economics. It's the fault of corruption. It's the fault of the corporate banking system and the whole debts. It's the fault of the huge amount of uh, money which is absolutely being poured down the drain, wasted 1.6 trillion dollars a year on, uh, on armaments we're at, at again now. So no, 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 we're, um, uh, I, think, I, I think we're all doing the right thing. I don't think we're doing the wrong thing by telling the public the truth and demanding that these changes are made and they happen Quickly. I don't think we're instilling despair into people. I mean, if I thought that for a minute, I'd quit. And, and by the way, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a medically qualified doctor, so I've heard this argument, okay? I spent my life in medicine, right? Um, people don't, they're not like deer. People don't go into despair when they're told that they have a sort of overwhelming or life-threatening situation. That's not what human beings do. And our whole history is that we rise to challenges that seem to be overwhelming and impossible, and we overcome them, and we succeed and we prevail, and after 200,000 years, here we are, you know, discussing about how to save the planet. I hope you're right. I, I will say, in, in a hopeful sense, I'm again speaking as an educator, uh, what you see at, like at University of Colorado is this is environmental studies is this huge program now. Everyone wants to get into it. Um, and this is uh, uh, students who are, you know, 22, 21 years old, who have never known a time when there wasn't a climate change debate. And they're all into this. They're all very interested in this and, and increasingly aware of the issues. And they're coming in droves to be studying this thing. So there is hope. In terms of the internet, um, if I'm looking 15 years ahead, I would want to say no to 5G, no to fifth generation of wireless infrastructure. No to the Internet of Things where we are flooded with machine-to-machine -machine communications. And then in the pot, you know, how would I phrase that um, affirmatively? I would say, I have enough. We have enough. And I don't know how to teach that, but that's the concept. <laughs> Just one comment on that. Um, I don't think we can tell India and some other parts of the world that you can't have more because they're in pretty uh, low status and I hope that there are not going to be that there is not 
I, I think that there is potential in innovation to do things more energy efficiently. I, you're, you're, I'm wondering about your silicon because are we going to be using silicon 20 years from now or do we have some uh, other ways of doing the numbers which is going to be a lot more energy efficient? Graphene. What is it? Uh, graphene. Pardon? Graphene. Well, yeah, or even uh, other. <coughs> what is it when you're doing the molecular, the, uh, yeah, anyway, I, th I, I think that, uh, that it's not going to be more and more silicon, I hope, uh, and, and, that, and that we will find ways, but we have to have the, <laughs> I'm a broken record, but we've got to have the incentives to find those ways, uh, but I think we can do it. Uh, and I think young people need to be challenged to be doing that. Uh, they, but they do have to know what the situation is, too, so we have to be honest about that. At the moment, as I understand, we're manufacturing ten times as much silicon for solar panels than for electronics. Most of the production is happening in China where there are essentially no regulations whatsoever in terms of the emissions like I, the ones I read to you from New York State smelters. Um, I also just read about a month ago that there are now some bi, um, biodegradable transistors. I don't, I don't know what they're made from. I just know that they're being made and I don't know. It's like you're, you're going to be able to buy things for less than $10 and they'll biodegrade. But I am so suspicious because just this constant consumption of more and more things is, it, it's just a problem, it, even if it does biodegrade. But I, it's, I, I don't understand it. It's more than I understand. The, the, I'd like to say that the burning of coal has to be prohibited. Um, you know, I like, don't like to mention this, but I, I mean, all the wind turbines and everything, they're being made by burning coal. That's how they're being manufactured, right? And um, uh, yeah, um, I, I, I hear it about, you know, India and, and China, and um, my God, I'm a Brit, you know, we haven't treated the, those countries particularly well. Um, but uh, the first people, and they're, su they're doing it already, the first people to suffer from climate change are the poorest people in the poorest countries, right? So um, uh, uh, we, c we just can't continue burning coal, that's out. I mean, that is causing the deaths of millions of people a year from air pollution. When global warming gets worse, it's going to increase that air pollution. So we do need a ban on coal. We must prohibit the burning of coal. Uh, if that continues, there, there's, there's, I mean, there, there's no future, right? So I wanted to comment on, um, I do believe it is time for solutions. And Dr. Hansen, Dr. Srez, everybody here has done work on sounding the alarm and telling everybody, telling the world how much danger we're in. And that's really very important work that everybody has done. And I think that it's very much appreciated that, that this has, work has been done. But we have to work now on solutions. Uh, we've, we've as, as was mentioned, we've been talking about this since 1992, actually before. My co-author wrote a book in 1972, and they already knew that burning carbon could cause global warming. And they, he talked about global warming in his book in, in that, at that time, or perhaps he published it in 1973 or 4, I can't remember the exact date. So we've known it, and, but we have to, how do we motivate people now to, to make this energy transformation that we need. We have the fossil fuel in its industry that is entrenched, that is receiving subsidies. It's not like the last turn of the century when people were on horse and buggies and the Ford Model T came out from the assembly line and everybody jumped and 
jumped onto the Ford Model T and we had a transformation in 13 years or less. We, we have a different um, market today. So in World War II, we decided to fight fascism. We were debating whether to be involved and then we got bombed by Pearl Harbor. It, not by Pearl Harbor. Pearl Harbor got bombed um, by the Japanese and that motiv motivated everybody to act. I think Steve has been talking about, well, how, in some sense, his questions to me are, how bad does it have to get before we're going to act? Uh, Hurricane Sandy didn't do it. Um, um, the other hurricanes haven't done it. These forest fires in California where we had horrible forest fires that are apocalyptic forest fires. Um, British Columbia was burning. We had burning in, in Alaska. We were burning in um, Nordic countries in, in Sweden. Uh, yep. was it Sweden? You know, places you can't, I, we, I went up to try to get away from the fires in California to the San Juan Islands for the summer. And, and there was, you know, we had bad air because of forests burning in British Columbia. Okay, so that's not enough. Apparently, that's not motivating us. Apparently, Wall Street being flooded isn't enough to, to get us acting. California is moving on this. That's awesome. Uh, uh, New York has passed some laws in New Jersey for 100% electricity. Hawaii for 100% clean electricity. Actually, Hawaii is, I believe, 100% renewable. Uh, the other states are for clean, um, clean electricity. But what, what do we need to do now? You know, I don't think it was a discussion of that we haven't done the right thing. It's that now, you know, it, it is like talking to teenagers. I have two teenagers, well, a teenager and a preteen now, which is kind of um, traumatic for me because <laughs> talking to them is very hard and getting them to listen, to put on their coat is hard. And, and so, you know, that, I think that's the question we're, that his, Steve's asking. I think that's the question that, that, was, that we're asking right now. Well, l let's assume that everyone is motivated. Um, we've been very clear that we were saying that we need a carbon fee to um, recognize the true cost of what carbon is doing to the atmosphere. I'm saying, and I think you're somewhat agreeing, that we should, that eating animal products, stopping eating animal products is another thing that people can do that would contribute positively. Um, Katie is saying that we should reduce consumption of everyone. You're all sort of saying to stop subsidies for fossil fuels. Um, and I think we're saying you want to move towards renewable energy on replacing the current sources of energy with renewable energy. So let's just try to one more time go through each of you and just kind of restate again, um, if you had motivation, if you had cooperation, if we had the money, if the president would listen to you, what are the the three things, so we're saying a fossil fuel, you're saying absolutely there's got to be a carbon fee, and we're saying absolutely we should not eat animal products. Are we saying we should only eat organic because that would reduce chemicals? Like what are, assuming we have the motivation, what are the action steps that you want us or the president to take, try to be more direct, less theoretical? You know, in other words, assume we will, we're all bought in, everyone's bought in, people watch the video, and they just want to know what to do. So the first thing is, everyone now knows to say to the politician, we need a carbon fee. They know they're supposed to eat less animal products. They know they're supposed to say no more subsidies for um, fossil fuels. Um, what else clearly are you saying, are there three things that you would like, three things that we should all make sure to do or tell a politician to solve this? Embrace science education. We should all be checking our bank accounts, no matter how wealthy or unwealthy we are, because we'd find out that um, a lot of our money is being used, right, to um, uh, build more uh, coal plants and um, uh, more tar sands and more pipelines. And um, I, I can attest, uh, um, uh, admittedly, I did it very slowly, but years ago I started transferring all my savings investments from uh, uh, into renewable energy, right? So now uh, uh, all my money is in renewable energy. So I, I'm really invested, you know, in, <laughs> in seeing this thing work out. 
Well, uh, my friends told me that I was most unwise years ago when I started doing this. Well, I've done just fine. I think individually, I, I really get the message um, on personal responsibility. I think that's really, really important. We are definitely all part of the problem, right? Um, uh, but individually, if we get our money out of fossil fuels and put our money into renewables, um, I think that would make a world of difference. You're, look, you're looking at me. <laughs> anyone, anyone, anyone that would like to comment on what Aid said? I can say one of the worst things you can do is download a video wirelessly in terms of energy consumption. So, again, recognize, um, I think smartphones showed up in 2007. Basically, that means everyone's got 24-7 mobile access to the internet and our consumption has increased exponentially. I'm just talking about media consumption. And the more pixels something has, as in um, a video has more pixels than a photo, which has more data than a voice call or uh, music, which has more data than a text message, as you increase the data that's transmitted, that requires more electricity, which re is going to generate more CO2. So download videos only by a wired device, by a wired computer. I'm not saying to get rid of wireless devices. Of course, I would love it, but I don't think it's realistic to say it but recognize that they are luxury items. Get your landline restored. You especially want that in the event of um, a power outage because a wireless device is going to run out of power. Um, there are lots of reasons to, to get a landline. Um, and try to reduce your own media consumption by 3% per month and just keep at it, 3% per month. Yeah, I, I think you're right about, I think you're right about the, uh, the internet and the IT. I mean, what are we doing with it? You know, we're just playing, right? I mean, just playing games, right? Burning up energy, burning up. I think you're absolutely right. We really have to question uh, the direction we're going with that, you know. Everything we invent, we seem to, our culture seems to have to use, you know. We don't, we don't seem to think about whether it's going to be good for the future or hurt the future, whether it's going to be good for the planet or hurt the planet. You know, we just seem to dive into it. And I, I think you're right, I'm with you. Um, uh, I'm, I, I don't think that's a great thing that we're doing at all. I just want to get back to the education bit for a minute. Uh, we've got a big problem here in that um, there's just too much ignorance out there too much of a lack of understanding of what the real science issues are. Oh, people say, oh, I read it on the internet, it must be right. No, it is not right. Um, and it is up to the informed citizen to be able to separate out what is good information, true information, from what is nonsense. And that means you have to be educated at some level on the science. I'm not saying everyone's got to have a PhD, right? But you have to be educated in the basic science issues, because unless we understand the science issues collectively as a society, we are not going to be able to address them. I, I, uh, one other thing we haven't mentioned yet, which I think is foundational to the problem, and that's uh, uh, the uh, campaign finance you know, our democracy has been totally subverted by money. Uh, and that, that's kind of the root of this whole problem. If we didn't have that pro if we had uh, democracy working the way uh, our founding fathers intended, then I, the fossil fuel industry would not be ruling us mm -hmm. the way that it does. And we, we just, 
you know, there was some talk about this. John McCain, at one point, was that was his big issue, but then he realized that he, he couldn't beat it and, and still get the nomination for presidency, so he gave up. And the whole country has kind of given up on it. Uh, it's, uh, it's a very fundamental uh, problem, which uh, I think we have to, have to address. I totally agree with you. You're absolutely right. It is, it, it, it is fundamental to um, our, our destruction of the future and the planet. Um, uh, it's massive corruption is what it is, right? You know, on a, on a massive scale. And so, uh, yeah, I'm really uh, glad you brought that up. I'm just going to sort of stick with my core area of knowledge and some level of expertise, I hope, which is to set some big audacious goals uh, that inspire people and motivate them around electrifying everything, powering it all with clean energy, uh, and setting the building codes and the planning and zoning permissions to create livable, walkable cities and adopt better lifestyles and other things and establish the incentives through carbon fees and other programs to allow those things to, to flourish and happen. Um, then unleash the genius of entrepreneurialism and an informed citizenry to go and make that magic happen and deliver on those visions and, and those goals. And, uh, you know, without sounding Pollyanna-ish about it, I think there's a lot of magic in that. Um, and where it is not possible because of entrenched interests and incumbencies protecting their own vested interests, use politics and the force of people power to take them down, to reverse the subsidies, the perverse subsidies they receive, to undo their hold on the democracy uh, in the streets and at the ballot box. With popular collective action driving the change.